Um, so, but there is, a, there is an understanding, I think, that they have to do something. I think that both parties know that this is an issue they're going to have to deal with, and it's going to have to be, it's going to have something that's got to roll their sleeves and deal with it in a real direct way. Is that an basic enough question? <laughs> I have a question. You're talking more about lifestyle change. Over here. I see that. Of course, it's like I see Council Association. We're talking about a lifestyle change. It's we the people are going to decide this, not the Congress. Because right now, everybody in here, how many of us will leave here, walk over to Terminal Tower, get on the rapid and go home? And then, or take a loop bus or a, a circuit at the end? No, most of us will leave here within five minutes, get in your car and see parking lot and drive home. So, regardless of raising the gas tax or not, other forces in the world are causing this the fuel shortage right now, China being one. You're looking at a lifestyle change in me. So it's no candidate. We the people have to want it. We look for alternatives. Like, rather than looking to gas, we, we are have survived on the convenience. There's a whole industry in this part of the world that's based on automotives from jobbers to making parts. And what you're talking about is, one, losing all those jobs. You must find some other place to replace them. The less need for cars you have, the less need you have for parts, etc. I have gotten to Metroplex. I have gotten to the East. I've seen it. Yes, I don't agree with that long ride. We don't have that here in Brazil, by the way. Not at all. So I think, to me, it's a grassroots problem. You're asking for a total lifestyle change. Today is quick. This is quick to sell one of my side over here. So I, I look at your proposal and I say we change Congress. Maybe the change has to come from the grassroots. You've got to convince people, like sitting in this room, your next door neighbor. What should the automobile be used for? That's what you're saying. And that's really my question. I didn't get it across. I can move who says who's an office without having a dramatic lifestyle change in where things are. <laughs> You live in the suburbs, by the way, it's a long walk to the grocery store. It's a great question. I think that it would be Pollyannish uh, to think that we're going that they're, that by policy change we're going to be able to change lifestyle. This is not about changing folks' lifestyle. This is, I think, responding to what we already see going on. This is absolutely not about taking away people's cars, forcing them downtown, causing them to live in the high rise and things like that. This is about providing choices. We have only done one thing in this country for a very long time. Um, and we, we've built roads, and we've done a very good job of it. It's decentralized metro areas. We heard from the panel earlier today what it's done to place some community. We see this all across the country. Um, but I think in terms of uh, people's uh, quality or uh, lifestyle, that we do see things changing. Um, again, the dramatic drop in driving has not just occurred because of the advanced price. I think it's really been accelerated by that. But we've seen this decline starting to happen over the last couple of years. Um, but because people have no other options for how to get around, they've only, had, they've only been able to drive. So we have people spending more and more money on owning a car. Those costs are going up. And then since the gas price spike has hit, driving has plummeted, trade ownership has gone right up. And all anybody wants to talk about is the fact it's not that positive thing. And look, transfer is going up. That has all the other benefits. But since there's so many folks who are stranded because they can't afford, because they don't have transit options, and they can't afford, afford the high cost of owning a car. So I think you're exactly right. The Congress needs to respond to what's going on across the country. And what we see is something that's very, very different um, than we have seen just a couple of decades ago. And I think that people are willing to pay for something different. The federal gas tax is a very sticky thing because it's, you're paying money to go through a black box and it's this trust us for Washington approach, which is not very palatable when gas is four dollars a gallon. What we see in metro areas all across the country are these referendum that come up for votes every November and sometimes in May for raising revenues to pay for transportation projects, from a whole host of things: gas tax, sales tax, mm -hmm. cigarette taxes, all kinds of different things. And those things are passed with generally high successes because it's closer to where they to where the people are, and they're voting for specific projects. And largely, those are, are taking the form of not just road projects, but road and transit projects, or transit projects alone. The competition for money for transit projects is off the charts. It's, a, it's an incredibly hyper-competitive uh, process right now to get federal transit money, because the queue and the desire to get it built is so intense. 
I absolutely don't think we should be dictating to folks what they what they do, but they need to have choices. The are not tethered to the problem. I have a question about the federal gas tax. Uh, is perhaps the federal gas tax applied to too many roadways? I mean, there's a lot of roadways out there that really are a local concern more than a national concern, and yet they're eligible for the federal gas tax. So what I'm suggesting is perhaps what we have out there right now is sufficient, but we have to reduce the eligible projects for which it's. And I mean, it, it kind of goes in the, in, in, along the way of let the locals raise the money they need, be it at a, at a state level or a county level or a municipal level, and let the feds get out of it. You know, I let the feds only be interested in the interstate and maybe the national highway system of a few other roadways. This is another way of, you know, getting, letting the locals decide how they want to pay for whatever they want. It's a great suggestion. I think that it, and it at least begins the conversation, I think, in the right way. If we're going to have less money, the federal government, which doesn't provide all of the funding, the states and local groups provide substantial, substantial funding, two-thirds of the money does not come from the federal government, um, that the federal government is going to have to prioritize. Would it make sense for them to prioritize spending on local roads? Probably not. It would probably make sense for them to prioritize spending on the big national issues. Whether or not they actually realize it or not, we think it should be. But the interstates are clearly a federal uh, prerogative. They built the thing. It's 50 years old. It needs to be fixed. All of us support. We need to reinvest in the interstate. Um, our international ports and gateways. I mean, these things that are the, where the goods come in. They don't come in and stay in LA Long Beach. They come in LA Long Beach and they go across the country. The federal government should have some concern about how that port and how that metro area is functioning. So it's all about prioritization. I'm almost agnostic to where they prioritize. As long as they start prioritizing somewhere, we can have a conversation. Um, but I think you hit the, hit the nail on the head is that um, we have been just taking the money and just kind of spreading it around without any real thought about what the purpose of the program is. I think we have time for one more question. I'll ask the last question. Unless anybody else has Rob, do you see uh, any specific role for the top planning organizations uh, as this reauthorization of yourself? That wasn't a step. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Fundamentally, we believe that uh, if we're going to be given the metropolitan areas more authority for transportation decision making, that the MPOs are going to have are, are going to be at the, the, in the bullseye of that. that. They're going to be have to give them more authority, more funding to make more decisions. Um, the problem is that it, it, nationally, it's not just the MPOs. Um, we know that they have been given generally felt a weak institutional hand. They were given more authority and, and more responsibility. They're not really giving more money, not really changing the rules a little bit. So I think we, we gave the we tasked the MPOs with doing something and then didn't really give them the ability to do that. That has to change the next time around. But I don't think in all cases it's going to be the MPO. So there's an institutional response to this issue of metropolitan decision making, which are the MPOs, and it makes sense in a place like Cleveland or in Denver or in Seattle, whatever, the in states, and what you can have see the MPOs doing good work. In a place like New York, it's very difficult. The MPO doesn't cover the entire metro area, which I think it does. In Florida, the MPOs are county based. So there's probably an institutional response in some cases, and then maybe a process response to others. Maybe an MOU between the governors of New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut to do regional decision making, or a port authority type response. Um, and there are also states. I mean, Rhode Island runs its transit system and does MPO planning. Maryland, you know, these places look very different from Arizona. And the bottom says otherwise. So the short answer is yes, I think there's an institutional response that directly affects the MPOs, gives them more power, more authority, and more accountability for decision making. And there's also a process response that can take any form that the governors decide to So we have our appreciation. Uh, the no <laughs> <laughs>